We have received thy mercy, O God, in the midst of thy temple. Words taken from today's introit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Edmund Campion was the son of very wealthy parents. Edmund went to the best schools in England during the 16th century, and he became one of the greatest speakers in all of the British Isles. Queen Elizabeth I, the heretic and illegitimate daughter of the infamous King Henry VIII, viewed Edmund Campion as one of the diamonds of England. The queen listened to his speeches with rapt interest and lavished upon him the greatest honors and even placed him under the care of the Chancellor of all England. Although Edmund realized the great religious errors of King Henry VIII and his successors, he maintained his Protestant position in order to promote his growing and brilliant career. Edmund even made the sinful mistake of acknowledging Queen Elizabeth as head of the Church of England instead of the Pope of Rome. Eventually, Edmund Campion was ordained a deacon by an Anglican bishop. But then the Holy Ghost intervened, and things began to change for the better. You see, Edmund began to study the ancient writings of the Christians of old. And having read the teachings of the church fathers, Edmund slowly but surely began to realize all of his religious errors. Filled with guilt and remorse, Edmund sought out a Catholic priest. He renounced his heresy, and he made a good confession and publicly assumed his state as a son of his holy mother, the church. This cost him not only his career, but also his physical safety within his own country. And so off he went to Ireland and eventually to France, where he would study for the holy priesthood. Ordained as a Jesuit priest, Father Edmund Campion desired to return to his native soil in order to spread the true faith in a land filled with error and with darkness. All during his formation, Father Campion prayed for the grace of martyrdom, that he would be given the immeasurable blessing of dying for the Catholic faith. Now, the mission that Father Campion had in England was purely spiritual, namely to find the lost sheep and to reclaim Catholics that had wavered under the evil and even heretical regime of Queen Elizabeth I. He and other Jesuit priests sneaked into England using disguises, fake names, and hiding places. Edmund and others served persecuted Catholics by offering Holy Mass, hearing confessions, and preaching the apostolic faith. While in hiding, Father Campion wrote his most famous work of all, what he called the Ten Reasons. This pamphlet, The Ten Reasons, proved the Catholic faith as true and Protestantism as false. It was printed and hundreds and hundreds of copies were placed into the hands of university students. The Ten Reasons publication spread so rapidly throughout the country, it caused the Queen herself to offer a large monetary reward for the capture and arrest of all Jesuit priests, but especially Father Edmund Campion. Well, on July 16th, 1581, Father Campion was offering Holy Mass in the house of a Catholic family. A government spy was in attendance. And like the infamous Judas of old, the spy left immediately after receiving Holy Communion in order to inform the police. After being arrested, Father Edmund Campion was brought to the Tower of London to be interrogated and tortured on the rack. During his imprisonment there, Queen Elizabeth herself visited his cell and offered Edmund his life, honors, liberty, and even a diocesan appointment as a quote-unquote Anglican bishop, if only he would acknowledge her as head of the Church of England. This fearless man flatly refused, and 
he flatly refused this offer of the temptress. Soon a mock trial was held that condemned Edmund Campion to death by being hung, drawn, and quartered. With the verdict and sentence, Father Edmund and other condemned Catholic priests and brothers sang aloud a line from Psalm 117. Haec dies, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The spy and the informant that had turned Edmund into the police ran up to him, knelt and begged his forgiveness, which was immediately granted. On a cold December day in the year 1581, a crowd gathered at the city gates of London through which the condemned prisoners would pass. Father Edmund spoke to the crowd in the following way, God save you all, gentlemen. God bless you, and may he make you one day good Catholics. As he reached the Tyburn, the notorious gallows where hundreds of Catholics were martyred for the true faith, Father Edmund Campion had a noose placed around his neck. His last statement to his executioners was memorable. If being a Catholic is to be a traitor, then I confess that I am one. In condemning Campion to death, Queen Elizabeth and all of her followers were condemning their entire Christian past and all of their Christian ancestors. Father Campion then prayed the Our Father, the Hail Mary, and the Creed in Latin. Heckled by the crowd for praying in the church's language of worship as opposed to English, Father Campion's boldly stated, I pray in a language that God understands. St. Edmund Campion then surrendered his soul as a martyr of fidelity to the apostolic faith and to the Pope of Rome. After the martyrdom of St. Edmund Campion, the Anglican Communion would eventually put forth a very, very strange and false theological hypothesis that was totally foreign to the apostolic faith. It was called the branch theory. To this day, the branch theory holds that the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Anglican Church are somehow three principal branches of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Although the church may have fallen into schism within itself, with various Christian groups being divided, each branch was still living upon the tree of the one church of Christ. This false theory soon evolved into the notion of countless supposedly Christian denominations all belonging to and participating in the one church of Christ. The church then became a Tower of Babel, with a diverse city of faith traditions and doctrines. An ecumenical movement would then arise, trying to put a Humpty Dumpty-like church back together again, with a reconciled diversity, agreeing to disagree and accepting one's ecumenical partner as he is. This theory of a divided church of Christ is foolishness. It is erroneous, and it's even blasphemous. The church is not divided. It is one. St. Evan Campion was not only a martyr for Christ in the true church, but he was also a convert, a man who turned away from his error and embraced the Catholic faith. Through the grace of God, Edmund realized that unity with Christ could only be found with unity with his mystical body, which is identical to the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, the supernatural unity that many long for in Christ, that one language of faith seen on Pentecost Sunday in the upper room, which ended the reign of the Tower of Babel and its religious errors and confusion, that unity would only be found when tied to the Church of Rome. The creed 
recited at Holy Mass, lists four marks, four major characteristics of the one true church, including oneness. The true church must be united in one faith and one love under one visible head, the Pope of Rome. The Catholic Church is not a Christian denomination. Remember that. The Catholic Church is not a Christian denomination. Rather, she is the one Christian church, the one and only mystical body of Christ, the one kingdom of God on earth, the one kingdom of God in purgatory and in the triumph of heaven. Catholicism is Christianity. Christianity is Catholicism. They are coextensive or synonymous terms. Only Catholics can be true Christians. No one who dissents from the Roman Catholic Church can be a true and full Christian. In one of his great papal encyclicals, Pope Leo XIII taught that separated members cannot belong to the same body. It's obvious. Pope Leo XIII wrote, quote, So long as the member was on the body, it lived. But separated from the body, it lost its life. Thus the man, so long as he lives on the body of the Catholic Church, he is a Christian. Separated from her, he becomes a heretic, unquote. Now, oftentimes today you will hear Catholics, even priests, refer to themselves as Catholic Christians. Granted, this is a very ancient term that was meant to distinguish a Christian who accepted the whole teaching of Christ from a heretic who rejected part of the whole. The term has taken on new and erroneous meanings today as if a Catholic Christian is just one element within the life of the church, as would be a Lutheran Christian or a Baptist Christian. Catholic Christian, then, has become a ridiculous and utterly redundant title, as if I said to someone, I'm a Christian Christian. A true Christian, a good Catholic, has the faith whereas false or quasi-Christians, objectively speaking at least, cannot have the faith. The common doctor of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas, taught, quote, it is absurd for a heretic to say that he believes in Jesus Christ. To believe in a person is to give our full consent to him and to all he teaches. True faith, therefore, is absolute belief in Jesus Christ and in all he taught. Hence, he who does not adhere to all that Jesus Christ has prescribed for our salvation has no more doctrine of Jesus Christ and of his church than does a pagan, a Jew, or a Turk." Unquote. Father Hans Urs von Balthasar, a favorite theologian of many in the modern church, once stated that if we cannot have unity of faith at the present moment, let us at least have unity of love. Oh, how sentimental, how charitable or supposedly charitable this sounds on the surface. But underneath, it is a devilish phrase reminiscent of reconciled diversity. Granted that we ought to love all our neighbors, even those not a part of the household of faith, we cannot be truly united in love unless there is the foundation of a unity of faith. Faith is primary. No unity of faith, no unity of love doesn't exist. Pope Pius XI of Holy Memory wrote the following, quote, The foundation of charity is faith. The foundation of charity is faith pure and inviolate. It is chiefly by the bond of one faith that the disciples of Christ are to be united. Faith is our chief unity on earth. A federation of Christians, then, is inconceivable 
when each member retains his own opinions and private judgment in matters of faith. Oh, I believe in the real presence. You don't. But we're still united, aren't we? We're not. A federation of Christians, then, continuing, is inconceivable in which each member retains his own opinions. How can men with opposite convictions belong to one and the same federation of the faithful? It's impossible. And let us put to rest, finally, that error so present today which suggests that the Orthodox, Protestants, Evangelicals, and so forth are somehow members or part of the church. To be a member of the true church, it's very clear, one must be sacramentally baptized, one must profess the entire Christian faith, and one must be united to the Catholic hierarchy within the church. Blessed Pius IX put it well when he taught that none of those religious societies separated from the Catholic Church, not even if you take them as a whole, constitutes in any way and are not the one true church founded by our Lord. Pius IX then continued, Further, one cannot say in any way that these societies are either members or parts of that same church because they are visibly separated from Catholic unity, unquote. The unity of faith and love that St. Edmund Campion sought was only in the Roman Catholic Church. She is the one bride of Christ, the one kingdom, the one temple. She is the church of the upper room conceived near the cross and born on Pentecost Sunday. Christ's prayer at the Last Supper that they may be one, has already been answered. That is not some sort of desire that Christ has, that they might be one one day. It's already been answered. The only real solution then to the scandal caused by division is the return of separated children to the Church of Rome and to the Holy See. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.